You can nail the perfect premise, sign a great cast, hire the right director, but you can't avoid the simple truth that some movies are a lot less than the sum of their parts. The romantic comedy Aloha was supposed to mark a winning return to form for Cameron Crowe, the Oscar-winning writer and director who had us at Hello in the 90s with Jerry Maguire. Aloha had so much going for it, too. A scenic setting, a sweet plot, and an A-list cast that included the undeniably lovable Emma Stone. But all was not well. Between accusations that Crowe had whitewashed the diverse face of Hawaii, limited pre-release access for reviewers, and a studio head who privately disliked everything about the film from the get-go, the movie landed at the box office with a dull thud. It never recovered. The total gross amounted to a sad $26 million, leaving it more than $10 million shy of earning back its budget. After Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland became a billion-dollar hit at the box office, a sequel was a foregone conclusion, the thinking being that even without Burton at the helm, audiences would pay to see Johnny Depp romping around Wonderland a second time. Have you any idea why a raven is like a writing desk? But despite an ensemble cast of A-listers and just as much Mad Hattery as the first film, Alice Through the Looking Glass failed to replicate the magic of its predecessor. It earned a paltry $27 million on opening weekend domestically. The first movie had over four times that. Derided by critics as a lazy, hollow retread, Alice Through the Looking Glass was overshadowed by both the simultaneous release of X-Men Apocalypse and a scandal surrounding its leading man, as Depp's soon-to-be ex-wife Amber Heard alleged that the actor had physically abused her. In the golden age of reboots, it was only a matter of time until someone made a CGI-heavy summer blockbuster out of the classic chariot racing drama Ben-Hur. Based on a novel that had been adapted no fewer than five times, Ben-Hur had a $100 million budget and a promising premise. The sweeping epic history of Gladiator mashed up with the edge-of-your-seat action of The Fast and the Furious. Alas, where previous Ben's Hur had been big successes at the box office, this one tanked. Variety declared it the biggest bomb of the summer after an $11.4 million opening weekend, and later reported that the film had cost MGM a write-down of $48 million. It's hard to believe that a movie as notorious as Catwoman was once supposed to be a huge hit, but in 2004, dressing up Academy Award-winning actor Holly Berry like a butt-stomping feline dominatrix sure seemed like a recipe for raking in the bucks. Catwoman was a character already beloved by Batman fans, superhero flicks were reliable box office draws, and Barry certainly looked the part. What could go wrong? Game over. Guess what? It's overtime. As it turned out, pretty much everything. The movie apparently blew all of its $100 million budget on leather underwear and CGI cats, leaving nothing left over to pay for things like, say, a coherent script. Ultimately, the movie's domestic gross was an abysmal $40 million, and Barry, who showed up in person to collect her Razzie Award for the film, was happy to agree that Catwoman is the creative equivalent of a hairball on the carpet. Although movies based on true-life disasters can be hit or miss, Hollywood had every reason to believe that they had a winner on their hands with Deepwater Horizon. The movie had a premise that was made for the big screen, and a star, Mark Wahlberg, with a solid history of well-performing movies. But where Wahlberg and director Peter Berg were able to make a sleeper hit of Lone Survivor, their far more expensive reunion in Deepwater Horizon couldn't capture that same box office magic. Whether due to poor marketing choices, a bloated budget, or the negative connotations of the words Deepwater Horizon, the movie was one of the biggest flops of the year in the U.S. It brought in a disappointing domestic gross of $61.4 million in total. The worldwide numbers improved the picture, bringing the total take to $121 million. But with marketing costs taken into account, it still added up to a rare and expensive misfire for Berg and Wahlberg. In 2016, with a number of female-led movies raking in the millions, Hollywood had every reason to believe an all-lady reboot to the classic Ghostbusters franchise would turn out to be a veritable cash cow. The fact that it acted as a reunion between Bridesmaid director Paul Feig and stars like Melissa McCarthy and Kristen Wiig only sweetened the deal, as did the involvement of Kate McKinnon and Leslie Jones. Despite a tidal wave of buzz and a little controversy, the publicity failed to translate into dollars at the box office. The movie cost $144 million for production alone and would have needed a worldwide gross of $300 million to break even. Sadly, it didn't even come close. The final worldwide gross was just $229 million. Nowadays, Green Lantern is remembered as such a notorious loser that even star Ryan Reynolds couldn't resist using it as a punchline in his other, far more successful superhero flick. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you me, Deadpool. 
Back in 2011, however, the movie seemed like a sure thing for many of the same reasons that Deadpool did. Namely, Ryan Reynolds in skin-tight spandex playing a lesser-known comic book superhero who opened up fun and exciting possibilities for expanding the DC universe. Sadly, this formula fizzled, and critics were not charitable with their assessments. Green Lantern had a decent opening weekend, but for a film that cost $200 million for production alone, its $219 million worldwide take was a huge disappointment. Audiences love Steve Carell, which is almost certainly what Hollywood was thinking when they threw $175 million worth of production money at Evan Almighty. A sequel to the infinitely more successful Jim Carrey movie Bruce Almighty, this movie gave Carell's supporting character from that film his turn in the spotlight. By and large, this was supposed to be a crowd-pleasing summer comedy the whole family could enjoy. Unfortunately, Carell was working with a lackluster script and a ludicrously expensive cast of CGI wildlife and not even his considerable charms could float a film critics derided for being preachy and unfunny. A late summer push got Evan Almighty past the $100 million mark, but that was a small victory against its overall shortfall. With a familiar fairy tale at its center and a blockbuster director at its helm, Brian Singer's Jack the Giant Slayer should have been a solid moneymaker at the box office at the very least. In fact, the film was so readily expected to be a success that even the folks who analyze movie flops for a living struggled to explain its dismal performance. Was it the March release date? The lack of a franchise tie-in? Nobody really knows. Whatever the reason, Jack did so badly out of the gate that pundits immediately compared it to John Carter, which, suffice to say, was not good news. Warner Brothers reportedly pumped close to $200 million into the CGI adventure, plus another $100 million for marketing. With a global gross of $197 million, poor Jack ended up more than $100 million in the hole. The long, strange saga of Dwayne Johnson and Black Adam stretches back more than 15 years. The wrestler-turned-movie star first announced his intention to play the DC Comics anti-hero in 2007. Shazam! Over the years, the project grew and mutated, gaining and shedding directors, existing in a kind of perpetual limbo. Meanwhile, Johnson became one of the century's most recognizable and bankable leading men, and superhero movies became a license to print money. But when these two unstoppable box office forces finally combined in October 2022, and actually went pretty badly, Black Adam fared well enough overseas but only grossed $168 million in the US, which for today's top-heavy tentpole releases marked a serious disappointment, if not an outright disaster. So what happened? Well, the film was caught in a perfect storm of shifting cultural trends and corporate drama. The COVID-19 pandemic had forced delays in filming, and the release date was pushed back from July 2022 to October to accommodate health concerns about large indoor gatherings. But after postponing for four months, audiences were still understandably shy about packing multiplexes for a character they didn't already know and love. Even for hardcore comics fans, the film was dead on arrival, as it was clear that the new Warner Brothers Discovery regime was uninterested in maintaining the old DCEU continuity. Sure enough, two months after the film's release, Johnson released a statement confirming that there would be no Black Adam 2. Martin Scorsese's 2011 family film Hugo was a critical success, appeared on over two dozen best-of lists at the end of the year, and won five Oscars. It's a technical marvel and a tribute in both form and function to the magical days of early cinema from one of the medium's true masters. It was also an utter box office bomb. Not even the premium charge for 3D tickets could save it. Originally budgeted at $100 million, the cost of creating Scorsese's dream world version of 1930s Paris soared north of $150 million, and made less than half that in U.S. theaters. And while the trailers promise a fantastical kids' adventure with the eponymous Hugo living in the walls of a train station, the actual film is more concerned with the spiritual rehabilitation of real-life cinema pioneer Georges Méliès. Perhaps this subject was a bit too esoteric for families who had plenty of other options at the multiplex that Thanksgiving weekend, from the Muppets to Puss in Boots. Talk of a fifth Indiana Jones movie started not long after the release of the fourth, 2008 smash blockbuster hit Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. But it would take another 15 years for Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny to see the light of day. It's not the years, honey. It's the mileage. When the movie finally hit theaters in July 2023, it came with a new studio in Disney, a new director in James Mangold, and a reportedly gigantic $300 million budget, plus another $100 million on top for marketing costs. There would seem to be no surer bet in Hollywood than a new Indiana Jones movie, and yet Dial of Destiny faced a surprisingly steep uphill battle. Details of the plot were kept top secret, which allowed inaccurate rumors about Phoebe Waller-Bridge's character replacing Indy to flourish among the reactionary wing of indie fandom. Then the film premiered at the Cannes Film Festival a full five weeks before opening in theaters, and a tepid reception there quickly lowered expectations for its domestic release. 
Dial of Destiny endured a $60 million opening weekend in the States, and although the overall critical response has been kinder than can, the film's bloated budget and underperformance at the box office have doomed it to be little more than a footnote in movie history. Who's to blame when a movie flops? There are dozens, if not hundreds, of variables that weigh on a film's success or failure, and the quality of the film itself is sometimes the least important. If you ask Ridley Scott, however, the blame for his 2021 medieval epic The Last Duel falls squarely and solely on the backs of those darn millennials and their phones. After the film opened fifth at the box office behind a string of franchise hits, he told Mark Marin, The millennium do not ever want to be taught anything unless you are told it on the cell phone. Back in 2019, The Last Duel seemed like a hot commodity, a real-life tale of 14th-century justice whose themes of sex, power, and patriarchy made it a perfect fit for the Me Too era. Matt Damon and Ben Affleck were set not only to star, but script together for the first time since Good Will Hunting, alongside filmmaker Nicole Hall of Center. Affleck eventually took a smaller supporting role, and Adam Driver stepped in as the younger lead. Delayed nearly a year by the pandemic, the film sank like a stone at the box office, but later found its audience on home video and streaming. Maybe Scott was right after all. Is 2021's The Matrix Resurrections yet another example of studios shamelessly strip-mining their IPs for parts and cashing in on millennial nostalgia, or is it a harsh criticism of exactly that, offered up by a filmmaker with nothing to lose? I'm sure you can understand why our beloved parent company, Warner Brothers, has decided to make a sequel. It's likely both. Director and co-writer Lana Wachowski took a bitterly meta route with the fourth Matrix movie, crafting a world in which both the Matrix and the Matrix exist, and where the corpses of Neo and Trinity have literally been pieced back together in order to provide power for the machine's failing infrastructure. Back in the real world, the film fought its own battle with the unintended consequences of a runaway technology, streaming. At the height of the pandemic, Warner Brothers instituted a simultaneous release policy, wherein theatrical films would be available on HBO Max for the first 30 days of release. For Resurrections, the result of this strategy was disastrous, and the movie suffered a $10 million opening weekend on just over 3,500 screens. It was so bad, in fact, that producers Village Roadshow Entertainment sued Warner Brothers for breach of contract, claiming that the studio intentionally gutted the film's box office in order to increase end-of-year streaming subscriptions. Resurrections would go on to gross just $157 million worldwide against a reported $190 million budget, and in the two years since its release, there has been practically no talk of another sequel. Of all the attempts to recreate the success of the MCU over the last decade or so, the one that made the most sense on paper was Universal's so-called Dark Universe, which would have rebooted the studio's stable of classic movie monsters. Sadly, Universal's first attempt at kickstarting a MonsterVerse, 2014's Dracula Untold, was unsuccessful. Then they tried again three years later with The Mummy, an ungainly beast of a film about an army officer who accidentally awakens a vengeful undead Egyptian princess and discovers an entire world of supernatural threats. In an extreme case of putting the cart before the horse, Universal announced an entire slate of Dark Universe pictures, including remakes of The Invisible Man starring Johnny Depp and Bride of Frankenstein with Javier Bardem and Angelina Jolie. Russell Crowe's Dr. Henry Jekyll would be the Nick Fury-like connecting tissue between the films, leading up to the inevitable Avengers-style monster mash. Alas, it was not to be, as The Mummy was a critical and commercial failure, collapsing into dust at the box office and taking the entire Dark Universe down with it. Years later, all that remains of this experiment in corporate hubris are the Dark Universe social media accounts, which still tragically promise the gods and monsters to come. As COVID spread across the world in 2020, prompting quarantines and prohibitions against large public gatherings, movie studios had a tough choice to make about the films they had scheduled for release. Should they push the entire slate back, hoping that public health conditions improve? Do they hold back their biggest releases and let smaller films play to mostly empty theaters? Or do they keep those big films on the calendar in hopes of luring audiences out of their homes? Most studios opted to delay releases or premiere them via streaming, especially after the underperformance of Christopher Nolan's Tenant in August of that year. Every Nolan film is an event, but Tenet was eventier than most. A massive spy vs. spy with time travel action flick chock full of men in stylish suits, exploding airplanes, and reams of gibberish exposition. How would you like to die? Old. You chose the wrong profession. The film was made to be seen on the biggest screen possible, but arrived at a moment when people's lives depended on staying home. Tenant was delayed from June to late August due to health concerns, but the decision to release theatrically at all was met with controversy. Actor Seth Rogen, whose own film, An American Pickle, went direct to streaming, joked to The Hollywood Reporter at the time that Nolan seemed intent on killing his greatest fans. In the end, the film flopped at the box office, earning just $58 million in the U.S., and its failure was a stark message to the rest of Hollywood. If Christopher Nolan couldn't get butts back in the seats, there was little hope for anyone else. 
Watching the three trailers released for Brad Bird's 2015 adventure Tomorrowland, it's clear that Disney knew it had made a visually striking film, but had no idea how to sell it. Each preview is by turns a Peter Pan riff, a Chosen One Save the World narrative, and a Cracker Jack action adventure. All of these elements are in place in the film, but what struck audiences and critics was its all-consuming earnestness about believing in the future, a wet-eyed sincerity that crossed over from corny into actively embarrassing. The marketing was strong enough to earn Tomorrowland the number one spot at the box office over Memorial Day weekend, edging past Pitch Perfect 2, but its fortunes quickly faded, and in the end, the movie grossed just $90 million domestically against a budget of $190 million. Once critics and pundits had seen the film, much of the discourse was about its allegedly Ayn Rand for kids ethos. While Bird has always denied that the movie features any libertarian bent, it's hard to look at Tomorrowland itself, a faraway land where visionaries can ply their genius away from the ignorant opinions of ordinary people, and that's see a Disney-fied version of Going Galt. Warren Beatty has accomplished a lot in his seven-decade career, and he's gotten away with even more, but it hasn't all gone well, and no doubt some setbacks are harder to get past than others. Take Town & Country, a long gestating boondoggle of a middle-aged romantic comedy that sank like a stone when it was released in April 2001. The tale of an aging Lothario juggling the many women in his life that reportedly spent much of its $90 million budgets on securing its A-list cast. The New Line Cinema must have had high hopes for the film when production began in 1998. By the time it stumbled into theaters three years later, they had lost all confidence. Town & Country opened at a dismal seventh place at the box office, trailing far behind its competitors. Director Peter Chelsom survived the debacle, at least, and went on to helm hits like the holiday rom-com Serendipity. Beatty, meanwhile, took a break from filmmaking. He wouldn't appear back on the big screen until the 2016 Howard Hughes biopic Rules Don't Apply. He's a red panda! Sick. You're so fluffy! You're so fluffy! I've always wanted a tail. When it comes to flops and failures, numbers don't always tell the whole story. A massive box office take might actually turn out to be a failure if the movie costs too much to make, or a dismal box office gross on paper might only be half the picture. Pixar's 2022 coming-of-age film Turning Red, about a Chinese-Canadian girl who transforms into a giant red panda, took in a $20 million worldwide box office total. But what that number doesn't tell us is that the movie was never theatrically released in the US or any other country that has access to Disney+. After debuting two Pixar films on the streaming platform in 2021, Disney initially planned for Turning Red to be Pixar's return to theatrical distribution. However, the Omicron variant surge at the end of 2021 scuttled those plans, and writer-director Dumi Shi's feature debut became a Disney Plus original instead. So there's a pretty big asterisk on the film's disastrous box office haul. But does that make it a secret hit? The world of streaming viewership ratings is notoriously vague and untrustworthy. Companies such as Netflix, Apple, and Disney will tout successes and hide failures using metrics that are difficult to translate. It's worth pointing out that Turning Red was the number one streamed film of its debut week according to Nielsen's rankings of ad-supported streaming, with a reported 1.7 billion minutes watched. But how that translates to the theatrical experience of audiences actually watching a movie from beginning to end is anyone's guess. After sneaking musical numbers into a number of his earlier movies, Steven Spielberg finally took a shot at one of the most popular movie musicals of all time, West Side Story. Playwright Tony Kushner adapted Leonard Bernstein and Stephen Sondheim's 1957 Romeo and Juliet riff about warring New York street gangs. It emphasized the Sharks' Puerto Rican heritage and placed their conflict with the White Jets in the context of a rapidly gentrifying mid-century Manhattan. The film was widely acclaimed by critics, nominated for seven Oscars including Best Picture, and won Best Supporting Actress for Ariana DeBoise's fierce turn as Anita, but no one went to see it. Whether it was the surging Omicron variant keeping older audiences away from theaters, a marketing campaign that deliberately downplayed that it was a musical, star Ansel Elgort's 2020 sexual assault allegation, or some mixture of all that, moviegoers had little interest in a new West Side Story. After being delayed a full year due to COVID-19, the film opened in December 2021 with a weekend gross of $10.5 million, just enough to beat Encanto for the top spot. The next week, however, it was trounced by Spider-Man No Way Home. West Side Story concluded its theatrical run with a worldwide gross of just over $76 million, a far cry from its $100 million budget, or the estimated $300 million it needed to break even. As the pandemic upended the film industry in 2020, it seemed like any decision was the wrong one. To delay a film for months, if not a whole year, risked irrelevance. To push a film into theaters when shutdowns were ongoing seemed suicidal. To release a film in theaters and on streaming at the same time invited its own host of concerns. After Warner Brothers took a bath on Christopher Nolan's Tenant, they took a different route with the superhero flick Wonder Woman 1984. The Patty Jenkins Helm sequel premiered in theaters and on HBO Max on Christmas Day 2020. I've never wanted anything more. 
The first Wonder Woman had become a legitimate phenomenon in 2017, as well as the highest domestically grossing and best-reviewed film of the so-called DC Extended Universe. 1984, to put it mildly, was not. Critics were split as to whether the movie's brighter, more comedic tone was a breath of fresh air after the dourness of DC's Snyderverse films, or too goofy to take seriously. The film pulled in just $46 million at the U.S. box office, a stunning 90% drop from the first film's take three years earlier. But while 1984 was a disaster in theaters, it was a hit at home. HBO Max subscriptions reportedly doubled at the end of 2020, giving Warner Brothers the confidence to premiere its entire 2021 slate in theaters and on streaming simultaneously. Expectations for Disney's 2018 adaptation of the YA classic A Wrinkle in Time were high, arguably too high. A Time Magazine cover profile of the film's creative team was even titled Hollywood's Once and Future Classic. Behind the scenes, producer Catherine Hand, writer Jennifer Lee, and director Ava DuVernay were calling the shots. On screen, the movie featured young actor Storm Reid as plucky hero Meg Murray, alongside Mindy Kaling, Reese Witherspoon, and Oprah Winfrey as the otherworldly Mrs. W's, as well as Chris Pine's turn as Meg's missing father. In the lead-up to its release, the film really did feel like a turning point in Hollywood, a big-hearted, patriarchy-defined shot across the bow for the power of women in filmmaking. One of the more pernicious aspects of that patriarchy, however, is that female-led films often have to be larger than themselves and they have to make a serious impact on the bigger picture for audiences to really turn out. This, of course, is something male-driven films rarely have to deal with. A Wrinkle in Time opened at number two at the box office in March 2018, finishing behind Black Panther. Reviews praised DuVernay's heart and ambition, but ultimately found the film overstuffed and underdone. It made $100 million at the domestic box office and fared even worse overseas. Ultimately, A Wrinkle in Time was estimated to have lost $130 million for Disney.